Eliza, it's great to see you again. And thank you everyone for being here. It's, I didn't realize how much it was going to move me to see all of you arriving and the greetings from all over the world and um, a couple of names I recognize even. And so I'm just really touched by this gathering um, and appreciate Tricycle for making it happen. Uh, all of us are finding our ways to respond and you all are uh, still putting out your, your regular um, offerings of a magazine and all the online um, things that you do. And in addition, offering this really needed space. So really appreciate that. So welcome um, to this evening. Uh, really would like to just share um, from the heart what's been going on for me. Um, with this pandemic, this uh, situation that we find ourselves in. But I wanna just start before I share some thoughts and ideas with you tonight with just a couple of minutes of grounding um, as people continue to arrive. So we'll just do a short meditation, one or two minutes and really connecting to what will be the theme tonight, with, which is just this, um, a teaching from the Bahia Sutta that really allows us to come back to our presence, to the present moment. Um, so I'd like to begin, if you'd like to close your eyes, you can. You can just begin to gather your attention, really set aside um, any other concerns or any other distractions for the moment. We're all on our computers, so it's easy to kind of get lost in other alerts or messages. Um, see if you can be here fully, let those go. Feeling the feet on the floor or the butt in the seat, feeling your connection to earth and ground right now. I'd like to begin as I always do in my teachings with a traditional land acknowledgement. And so we're all in different places, so the indigenous people of wherever you are will be different than mine, unless you happen to be in the borough of Brooklyn, which is the land of the Lenape peoples, or the indigenous people of this area. And I always like to begin with that sense of grounding to really feel the blessing of this earth that has been taken care of for thousands of years. With this sense of harmony and connection and really tapping into that that sense of balance, that sense of reverence for life and land, for the earth and for all of her inhabitants. Giving thanks for this opportunity to be here. And in doing so also giving a sense of acknowledgement and appreciation for these lineages, my particular lineage of Theravada Buddhism that comes through mostly the Thai forest tradition, teachings of Ajahn Chah. An appreciation for the ground that these teachings give us in these tumultuous times. Feeling the sense of groundedness that support us through this wisdom handed down through thousands of years of practice. And thank you to those of you who are mentioning the land of Huron, the land of the Tiwa people, an appreciation of the Chumash. And honoring our own ancestors individually as we begin our evening together. Welcome again to anyone who's just arrived. It's wonderful to be with you. And, and it's also quite intense moment. So 
I'd like to just speak to some of what has been arising for me and how the teachings of the Buddha Dharma have been supporting me um, in these really tender and powerful times that we're in. And the profundity of this moment that has been this collective pause. I don't think we've ever been in uh, a period like this as a species where really all of humanity is affected in this moment of global pandemic and the cacophony of responses to that um, can be quite overwhelming. So our, our attention has also been drawn in so many directions. I don't know about you, but this is my first pandemic. So um, I've been really winging it in a lot of ways, using my practice, yes, as the ground, but sometimes being really um, swirled about by just the dizzying amount of offerings that are out there um, in support and being thankful that I'm not necessarily getting lost in some of the nonsense that's happening, although I can get drawn into the news and some reactivity around that, but how even the practice um, can become part of this uh, just overload of information. A friend of mine is compiling um, a list of meditations and online offerings at the moment, and it's almost absurd how much there is right now. It's wonderful, and it also can um, be an indication of uh, our tendency to turn outwards looking for some kind of answer or um, some kind of um, uh, seeking to alleviate suffering. And I, I was, um, I've been kind of judicious about how much I'm showing up on screens uh, and in offerings, not because I don't think, I think it's wrong that people are offering, but, you know, I, I have to really check my own intention for when I, when I feel like there's truly something to say and truly something to take in and um, when I really need to turn inwards. And what I would like to explore with you tonight is um, this encouragement to remember to turn inwards um, so that we can listen deeply and respond to the immense suffering within us and, and outside of us from our own innate and deep wells of wisdom. And you know, I wanna start by acknowledging just the paradoxes of this moment because um, Again, this is the, the first time we may have felt this sense of interconnection where very few places on this planet right now have not been impacted in some way by this pandemic. And it's showing us the truth of the, these teachings that we are not separate. But we're not having the same experiences of this pandemic, you know, between and within countries and between and within cities, between and within communities, and even within the same household it's pointing to another truth that although we are not separate, we are not the same. And so depending on our economic circumstances, our physical vulnerabilities, um, our work lives, our living situations, the social realities of all of the identities and um, social locations of race, of class, of gender, our emotional capacities, we are affected by this pandemic differently. And my friend Dara Williams, a Dharma teacher, gave me a, a beautiful metaphor that I've been using that we finally can recognize we are not separate, yes, because we all feel the same rough waters within our ocean of interconnection, but we are also not the same, and we can see that we have different boats. We have different ways to navigate these waves, these rough, rough waves. So again, you could be having a very different experience um, economically, physically, socially, emotionally. And I'd like us to think of our boats as um, including our contemplative practices. So it's not just our material reality that determines our capacity to ride these waves with some measure of, of grace or ease or, or at least um, some stability in, in the tumult. Um, our, our contemplative practices can, can really uh, help to, to create some space, to create some sense of balance, even as things are moving. And so I just wanna encourage that we also acknowledge that everyone on this call has different challenges and different resources. People 
calling in from all around the world. And our contemplative practice is a powerful resource regardless of our other circumstances. It doesn't eliminate our other circumstances and it's, it's by no means a panacea or, or magic, magic pill but it can help us to kind of stabilize our boats or we can think of it as giving us some spaciousness so that we can balance. Um, and then, so we don't fall into our conditioned patterns um, of avoidance or fear or numbness or panic or shame or guilt about our situation, whatever, whatever they may be. As um, a friend reminded me, Thich Nhat Hanh has the stories of uh, after um, leaving the the war in Vietnam, many of the refugees were traveling on boats. And he says that even if one person could have a sense of practice, of stillness, of measured peace, that it could stabilize the whole boat. And so when we cultivate this capacity within ourselves through this contemplative practice, whatever is happening around us, um, we can weather these storms together. And how being with experience moment to moment being with it with curiosity and openness and responding from a place of clarity and kindness, then we can be there. And you know, that is the practice. What really helps me with this is a connection to the body. That's really what my practice has been about fundamentally for years. The body as this spacious field for seeing clearly and kindly what's happening in any moment. And it's not about rejecting what we're feeling and just going to the body as a way to get away from difficult feelings or difficult circumstances. That's just another type of reactivity because even practice can sometimes become part of our patterns, right? Part of, of our way of um, trying to stabilize by actually rejecting the moment. So, you know, to stay with the rough waters metaphor, sometimes we can use practice to try and get away from the waves and we may look calm, but under the surface, we're scrambling like crazy to stay afloat, like um, a bird or a duck moving its, its, its feet or, 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 um, or wings very quickly underwater. The peaceful, still practitioner who is a teeming mess of emotions inside which is probably describing you know, the first 10 years of my practice. We are in fact cultivating the capacity to be with and hold whatever is there. And so if that is that teeming mess of emotions inside, not trying to come to bypass and, and be in some idea of stillness, but to really just be with just this. So again, just this is a reference to the Buddha's instructions to Bahia, um, who was a great sage and master. And he was very advanced practitioner, and, but he understood that he was not yet truly free. So it's said that he went to see the Buddha and he pleaded for him to teach him how to truly become free. And the Buddha said, no, he wasn't gonna teach him. So Bahia asked again, and the Buddha said, no, again, like many of these stories of asking three times after the third time, the Buddha said to him, Bahia, you should train yourself thus. In reference to the seen, there will be only the seen. In reference to the heard, only the heard. In reference to the sensed, only the sensed. In reference to the cognized, only the cognized. That is how you should train yourself. When for you, there will be only the seen in reference to the seen, only the heard in reference to the heard, only the sensed in reference to the sensed, only the cognized in reference to the cognized, then by Ia, there is no you in terms of that. This, just this is the end of stress. Just this, what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized or known, that when we are really with the moment of what is happening, that's the end of stress. That when we are in the stories, in the thinking, in the patterns, that they will lead us into more tumultuousness, that we will capsize our individual or collective boats. 
and really, you know, 75% of this equation, the first three seen, heard, sensed, those are bodily sensory experiences. Just 25% is the cognized. And even that is just known in one moment, moment to moment. It's such the inverse of how most of us move through the world. It's like 95% just thinking and experiencing those loops of thinkings, those patterns and those ways of experiencing our lives in the world. So for me, just this can become a mantra or a guide for knowing where I am in any moment, especially when I feel these strong emotions, rather getting lost in the story, I allow myself to feel it. As Pema Chodron has said, you know, drop the story, feel the feelings. So I may notice a familiar feeling of fear in these weeks, a fear of what will happen to loved ones, what might happen to me, and particularly for me in this moment, what will happen to the collective? You know, what is happening economically? What kind of uh, suffering may be happening now or coming? And rather than get lost in those loops of projections into the future that I cannot know, I can simply say, just this, sensing tightness in my chest, just this, thoughts about those who may be economically vulnerable, just this, sensing my feet on the ground, just this, sensing the breath. And it's only from this, just this, that we're able to truly respond with wisdom and compassion, that we're available uh, and really um, present with an open heart for whatever is right in front of us. As I mentioned, I'm on Lenape territory in Brooklyn, New York, and New York is this epicenter and getting messages from friends in other cities and other countries. And what is it like here? And I see some of you are, are calling in from, from New York and, and you know that there are a lot of sirens. The other night I heard um, many sirens. I'm not too far from two hospitals. And, uh, but one was very close. And so I got up and looked out the window and someone was being wheeled out on a stretcher. So just this. And I've been sick. I wasn't able to be tested. This was weeks ago, but I'm assuming that I had COVID. Many, many of my friends have had symptoms and because of uh, our demographics, we're not uh, eligible to be tested. I know people have been turned away from the hospital. One acquaintance who passed away after being turned away. I've had friends' parents who've been admitted and then discharged. One friend's dad who passed away a few days ago. So it is very immediate here. My normal mode often is my reactive mode, let's say, is the fixing, the figuring out, the trying to um, make it all make sense, make it all better. And all I can really do is just be with just this, with the grief, with the tenderness, also with the connection, all the bonds and the joy that it's bringing and being able to spend more time with people who I don't normally spend time with, even if it is through Zoom or phone calls. Some sense of spaciousness in my life. So I've also been um, grappling with feelings of guilt. Is it okay to feel okay right now? To not have certain vulnerabilities that others might have? Okay, just this. And how, how does that feel? So I wanna offer just this as our meditation this evening for contemplation, for cultivation, and I'll lead us in a guided practice for about 15 minutes and, and then we'll have some time for conversation after that. So I wanna invite you to um, find a way of sitting or laying down that allows you to feel grounded so making sure that you have contact with the earth in some way, whether that's your seat on the floor or your butt in a chair. 
your feet on the ground. And beginning to really sense that so that we're not just thinking about being here, but we're really sensing that contact. Just this sensing the feet, the pressure, the feeling of gravity connecting us to the earth. And as you ground, feel that sense of connection, allowing any tension to just gently release without any doing or forcing, perhaps just softening the belly, softening the shoulders, softening the face, the jaw. Allowing the arms, the hands to rest in the lap or on the thighs or at your side. And for a moment, just in silence, sensing what just this is here for you right now. Perhaps the herd of sounds Just this sensed in the body, vibration, sensations. Or just this, what is known in this moment, thoughts of the day, commentary on the moment, And nothing needs to be grasped, nothing needs to be pushed away. Allowing just this. Perhaps sensing the breath. Just this of breathing in and out. Allowing this natural rhythm and process it's always with us and always connecting us to everything around. Allowing this, just this. To be our connection to this moment. to steadying our boat.
And if stories or patterns are arising, not making this a problem, recognizing just this, knowing. If you'd like, you can anchor and re-anchor again and again into the breath or into the body. Again, as that spacious refuge for practicing this presence of just this. Inviting you to practice in silence on your own for a few moments. And bringing this presence, this awareness to whatever comes, feelings, sensations, thoughts. Just as every day in this period, we're waking up to new information, to new numbers, to new experiences, our practice trains, up, trains us to wake up in any moment to new sensations, to start again with presence, bringing awareness to happen, what's happening, right now and now
Buddha said, Bahia, you should train yourself thus. In reference to the seen, there will be only the seen. In reference to the heard, only the heard. In reference to the sensed, only the sensed. In reference to the cognized, only the cognized. That is how you should train yourself. When for you, there will be only the seen in reference to the seen, only the heard in reference to the heard, only the sensed in reference to the sensed, only the cognized in reference to the cognized, then Bahia, there is no you in terms of that. When there is no you in terms of that, there is no you there. When there is no you there, you are neither here nor yonder nor between the two. This, just this, is the end of stress. This, just this, is the end of stress. So bringing our awareness back to screen where we'll have time to connect with each other. Oh, sorry, the bell is too loud. Sorry about that. Just this loud bell. Thank you so much, Sabine, for that lovely, really beautiful practice. Um, we're starting off with a question from Baker, who says, I'm very judgmental of people in public settings not wearing face masks. What can I do to settle myself? Yeah, Baker, I really um, <clears throat> connect with that. You know, being in a fairly crowded metropolis, um, 
it's challenging to see all the different responses and how they can um, you know, really rub up against each other almost literally sometimes. And um, we're not talking about just different preferences of normal day-to-day -day life, but things that could potentially cause harm. And I've seen that in myself with the kids playing basketball and skateboarding in the park down the street from me and um, the contact they're having or joggers running past um, very closely without masks on. You know, and I, I, um, I really had to uh, take care, to take care of myself in those moments. Um, I think we've all, if most people on this call are adults, and even if um, we're younger, we've spent a certain number of decades recognizing to some extent that we can't change other people <laughs> and definitely can't change strangers. Um, I've also seen some conflicts happen and I think it's not a time to encourage conflicts. Tensions are really high. So I've really taken to really acknowledging what I can do for myself in moments like that. I have a friend who's talking, uh, who's in LA, who's a public health specialist, and he, he talks about how he walks his dogs in the middle of the street now because he just can't tolerate how closely people are, are walking to each, next to each other on, on the sidewalks. And so um, taking measures to make sure that I feel safe um, is kind of my first step. Um, so separating myself, moving myself out of situations where I feel unsafe rather than trying to control the actions of others. And, you know, I, I think you're also asking a deeper question here, Baker, because there are um, maybe more than ever these differences of um, perception and understanding that are being, um, uh, where decisions are being made by people that are affecting large groups of people and um, we may not necessarily agree. And so being able to kind of have a wider perspective that we're not going to be able to control these forces, whether it's one person's individual actions or the actions of people who are controlling the fates of many people. And for me, the teachings of karma or kama of cause and effect are really helpful here because I can see that there are so many causes and conditions that led to um, one person not wearing a mask versus someone wearing a mask, um, as well as the causes and conditions that led to uh, the fact that African Americans are being unbelievably, um, incredibly disproportionately affected by, uh, because of systemic reasons of um, stress and health and poverty and um, conditions around um, services. And uh, so the causes and conditions that led to that, I can't change. So to be in contention with an individual or a whole system is to be in contention with the reality. And just in that moment, all I can do is really affect my response to it. Um, and that might be taking action to change situations, educate more people about wearing masks, um, or it might be taking action in changing systems, but I can't be in contention with the reality that led to that moment, if that makes sense. Thank you, Sebene. Um, there's a question from Jane. She says, justice is what I kept returning to. Wonderful, thank you. During the meditation, an ambulance siren sounded and I thought, just this. So can justice also mean emotions that aren't necessarily peaceful or pleasant? Oh yeah, thank you, Jane. That's such a great clarification. Yes, just this is whatever is happening at any moment. And it really allows us to recognize that practice is not about making something in particular happen. It's not about creating a particular state. Um, it's actually about adjusting our relationship to whatever is happening, whether that's internally or externally. So it's not about making peace happen or making um, silence happen or stability happen within us, but creating a response of ease, a peaceful response to whatever. So we may be feeling unease, discomfort, um, fear, but we have an easeful holding of that. And that, that's the balance of a spacious body, a spacious being that can hold whatever is there. Thank you. 
So Catherine says, Thich Nhat Hanh is one of my favorite Buddhist teachers. He comes from the perspective of having inner peace, but not being passive in times of injustice and oppression. How do you suggest we can go into the world for critical work and system change and structural change, holding on to our inner peace and groundedness? Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh believes that now is not a time to stay internal, but to do internal work in the, word, in the world. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Mm. Yeah, that's a really easy question. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, you know, it's, it's complicated because I think it's true. We, we don't have, uh, in a moment like this, uh, tons of time to waste, you know, in terms of uh, only tending to our internal uh, landscape until it's perfectly balanced so that then we can go out in the world. You know, this isn't retreat. Like, it isn't a time to retreat. This is the retreat. Like this is our practice, this experience, this situation. And we need moments, like we need to rebalance. Um, you can use all sorts of metaphors, but you know, let's use, um, let's say, uh, uh, performance. You know, we can't perform, let's say there's an hours and hours long performance of dance. Often dancers will I just pulled this up, so I'm, I might be off, but often dance a dance troupe, some of them will be on the stage and some of them will leave or they'll take breaks or there'll be intermission. And there are going to be times when we need our intermission, we need our breaks, especially with the onslaught of information that's coming at us. I know for me, especially in the early days, I was just taking in too much information. So I was trying to keep up on everything that was there. And, you know, I really think they should label relabel news, just bad news, because that, that is what it is. We're not getting the full picture. We're bombarded with just so much data. And it's hard to make sense. It's hard to actually have any inner sense of grounding. Um, if we're always in action mode, there has to be also rest and re-engagement and rest and re-engagement. And so, you know, I, I think it's called practice for a reason. We're not practicing to become good meditators. We're practicing so that we have this capacity and, and this resilience to be able to go into the world. In terms of affecting change, again, you know, that for me is really about not being in contention with reality. We're talking about um, hundreds, if not thousands of years of particular systems and, and many, many um, decades of particular realities that led to this moment. We're not gonna be able to change that um, with our individual action uh, in, in whole, but all of us can find ways to affect change um, in our communities, within our, our own friend groups and circles. Um, right now, one of the, the strongest ways we can affect change is actually by not doing, which we as practitioners are very well trained at, <laughs> you know, kind of stepping back and, and being able to take care of ourselves is actually taking care of others and not going out is helpful. We, we can donate, we can um, you know, make sure that disinformation is not being spread by, by by having conversations, um, especially with people who may not be seeing as clearly. We can also expand our perspective and understand what might be happening in other communities that we might not be connected to. So change isn't only about this active action that we have an idea. I also think that, um, you know, we have to be really careful about polarization. Uh, Dharma teacher Dawa Tarchan Phillips, um, he said something that really impacted me. He said, you know, it's not about taking sides, it's about taking a stand. And so this um, uh, tendency for us to kind of battle or be against something rather than be for something that we believe in is something that we can kind of check in our, our activism. Thank you, Sabine. So Reham says, thank you so much. Um, I'm a journalist and a writer and I find it difficult to focus on just this. It is difficult to think and live while stories are always there. Also, I'm an empath. Sometimes I feel scared of feeling too much. What do you suggest? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it feels like there are two, two kind of sides of that, what you were presenting, Reham. There's kind of the, the journalism and the writing, um, which I really identify with. And I love ideas. I love metaphors. Um, and ways of expressing things. And there's a way to find just this in that as well, 
right? So rather than getting lost in stories that spin us out and we can see the stories that perpetuate suffering for ourselves, um, mostly in our own minds and our own patterns and clear thinking that is actually like an expression of the Dhamma. You know, the, the teachings of the Buddha are, are stories, they're words. Um, we, he, he relied very much on metaphors and ways of explaining things that help us see things clearly. So that, that's a gift. It doesn't have to be a burden. And there can be a just this in writing, just this in speaking, just this in cognizing, as, as the Buddha said. And then um, to your um, the question of being overwhelmed by feelings, I think that uh, empaths and people who are highly sensitive there is, um, you know, sort of a modulating that has to be done of not taking in too much of other people's information, not taking in too many stories um, so that our systems don't get overwhelmed. And some people, it's the opposite. They numb, you know, the, when, when hard stories come, they kind of shut down, you know, and feel the closing off as a protective measure. And, you know, some of us can just go into kind of Netflix holes of, uh, you know, just show after show is a way to not have to think about things and not have to feel things. So for each of us, we're, we're looking for that balance. You know, this practice is not about sort of a passivity. It's really about um, finding a balance so that we're moving towards or away from things with a real clarity and kindness, you know, really understanding um, what's needed rather than our reactive just overactivity or just kind of collapse, um, which is what this culture normally kind of encourages. Thank you. So uh, Lisa says, I'm finding myself grounding and settling in my isolation, a revelation of centeredness. I feel guilty because I am around so much suffering. What can I offer others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really powerful question, Lisa, and um, probably one that many people have, uh, whether they're they're alone or um, or quarantined with others. Uh, this sense of what what do I have to offer? And I I've been really I think I mentioned been kind of grappling with that. Like, is it okay to be okay right now? You know, to not be um, extremely vulnerable. Um, and what I've really looked at is uh, who, who around me needs support. You know, I, I live uh, with my partner and so I'm not isolated, but I have reached out to friends who live alone to see how they're doing. And a couple were struggling. And so it was important for me to connect with them and continue to follow up with them. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what it is that you do for a living, but there may be ways that you can support um, your community in terms of what it is you do for work or um, who you're usually in contact with day to day. Um, your neighbors, if you have close neighbors around you, the elderly, there are places to donate uh, money, resources, energy, time. I see all my um, very crafty friends making masks right now. So there, there are so many ways we can participate in the moment and part, that can also be overwhelming in itself. But I think the, it's, we sometimes think that we have to make a big impact or um, you know, our guilt leads us into, can lead us into shame and feeling then no way to have an impact. But there are all these small ways that we can actually connect with others if we, if we really pay attention. Thank you. We have a question from Charles Lee. He says, I am a black American. I have been conditioned that the only way I can succeed in America is to be perfect. In fact, more than perfect. I remember my mother telling me I needed to be twice or three times as good as a white person to get the same opportunities. How can I reframe my mindset without losing my competitive drive? If so, how? Mm, yeah, there's, um, there's so much in that. Um, exploration that I really connect to as well. Um, you know, there's a, actually a sociological term for it called the stereotype threat, where um, people of color 
and often other marginalized people, women, it's been seen too, but it was first seen in African Americans that if they're reminded of their race, which most black people don't need to be reminded of their race, it's on their mind all the time, um, that they will often underperform on tests and in situations um, because the stereotype is so strong around them. So that leads to even more overdrive of, of striving and trying. Um, it leads to also a lot of black excellence, which is something to take pride in um, for, for having cultivated all those skills and all those capacities. Um, but to recognize the toll that that takes on the heart and on the body, um, you know, the, the fear that can induce in new situations or situations where you're quote unquote the only one or one of the only ones. Um, and there's a real kind of uh, refuge, I think, that can be taken in not placing yourself in that situation all the time. So yes, there's this drive to succeed and um, uh, that, that can take us places. And there can be a real, real refuge, uh, for example, in POC communities or African-American sanghas where that doesn't have to show up. And it doesn't have, only have to be a sangha and the Buddha Dharma. It can be um, clubs or, or uh, um, um, spaces or uh, communities that allow us to kind of relax and let down our guard a bit more. My first POC retreat, I, I've already been practicing for many, many years and had done many retreats, mostly in, in white Western Buddhist communities where, as my friend says, I was the only person of color besides the Buddha. And, um, you know, the, my first POC retreat, I didn't realize how much tension I'd been carrying and that I could drop. You know, that I, I wasn't sort of on guard to make sure that everybody knew my Buddhist credentials and how long I had practiced and, and that I was a, I was a real practitioner. Um, and the assumptions that would be made about me being new or not knowing very much or whatever story I would come up with and often would have confirmed. Um, so I, I really resonate with what you're saying and just encourage you to really take tender care of that and to find spaces where you feel supported and you don't have to carry that burden all the time, but know that, that it's real. Thank you, Sabine. Yeah. So Lori says, um, what are some exercises you successfully use to acknowledge and stop the story or stories that come up when you see, hear, and sense the existential world? Mm, another easy question, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know, Lori, if I would stop them, if I would say that I stop them. Um, I think I, I make enough space for them so that they can kind of untangle themselves. So for me, all those stories are often a lot of um, you know, old material, old ways of moving through the world. And they're often confused. They're not clear. Um, they're not the real reality of the moment. They can't be because they're stories. They're not actually just this, what's happening right now. And so my practice is actually just making space for them. It's not to make them go away or change things. Um, it's not that what's happening that's the matter. It's the relationship that then perpetuates it. I get caught in the story. I get wound up in the story. I keep the story going. Rather than just making space, just this, recognizing the story for what it is. And in a sense, they begin to untangle themselves. And, you know, that's not the end of practice. That's the place from which then we can engage with the world with more clarity and with more kindness, with more wisdom and more compassion. So just this is um, this place of freedom from which then we can be in right response to the world. Thank you. So we have time for about two more questions. Um, Miao says that to my mom recently visited me and stayed with my husband and I, and I found that I don't like my mom even though I do love her. I started to judge her, I felt annoyed by her easily, um, I felt she didn't have faith in me and was trying to control me, but what I found as well was that the things that I don't like about her are within me as well. And I hate that. Um, now that I'm pregnant, I don't want my child to not like me. I would like to hear your insights. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not a parent, but I, I am a daughter, and uh, I resonate with what you 
are saying about seeing in our parents or our mothers, um, you know, poor mothers <laughs> get so much of this, um, you know, patterns really that have been handed down through the generations. Uh, now we know that some of this is epigenetic. So not only does physical genetic material get handed down, but patterns and ways of being get handed down. And something that's really helped me um, is uh, really, um, I think it's Thich Nhat Hanh, the first time I heard this meditation to imagine our parents uh, or anyone you could do this with that you're having challenges with when they were five years old and doing almost a metta or loving kindness meditation. That's not about phrases, um, but it's really about connecting with that child that your parent once was, that your mother once was, and recognizing that she learned all of these patterns that they were handed to her for, through her families, through her community, through social conditioning, and that if she um, were truly happy, she probably wouldn't be in these patterns of suffering. And um, that if I had had the exact same um, experiences as my mother, I would be exactly like my mother. And there are certain things that my mother did, even with all her faults, that allowed me to start to practice, to start to grow. And so she, in some ways, she laid the path for my own freedom. And, and hopefully you can lay the path for, for your child's continued freedom as well. Thank you so much, Sabine. So we have a number more questions. We won't be able to get to all of them. So I would like to make the last question. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with you or to find more of your teachings, how can they do that? Oh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, my website is just my name, sabanaiselassie.com. And uh, I'm also on Instagram is where I usually post um, upcoming things going on um, if people are on that platform. Otherwise, I have a calendar on my website and there's a contact form and people are free to contact me. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sabine, for a lovely practice. Thank you for generously sharing. Thank um, you, Eliza. Thank you for everyone as well who joined us on this call. Just a few notes before we wrap up. Just a reminder that if you want to join the next practice, it'll be Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern with the Zen teacher, Kurt Spellmeyer. And we're going to continue this practice um, throughout a lot of the period of social distancing. So keep checking tricycle.org slash live for the schedule and also to view recordings of past sessions. And um, we are providing the sessions for free. So if you'd like to support this effort or our others, you can donate at tricycle.org slash donate. And we're very grateful to everyone who already has made a donation. And I just like to wish that everyone stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Eliza. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your attention and time. Bye. Thank you.